You are going to listen to a conversation between two people, a customer and a travel agent. First, look at questions one to five. As you can see, there are four alternative answers, A, B, C and D for each question. Decide which alternative is the most suitable answer for what you hear and circle the appropriate letter. You can see that there is an example in the book which has been completed. The part of the conversation relating to this example will now be played for you. Good morning. Can I help you? Hello. Uh, yes, well, I just want some information, actually. I'm trying to work out a trip at the end of the summer holidays. Yes. And I wonder if you could help me. I'm a student studying Arabic and... You can see that the student is studying Arabic, so the answer is B. Now the test will begin. Remember, you will hear the recording only once, so answer questions one to five as you listen. Good morning. Can I help you? Hello. Yes, well, I just want some information, actually. I'm trying to work out a trip at the end of the summer holidays. Yes. And I wonder if you could help me. I'm a student studying Arabic and I'm heading for Alexandria in Egypt to do my language year abroad out at the university there. Right. I just need to get a few preliminary details. I'll put everything on the computer as we go along. OK. First, when do you want to leave? I have to be there by the 27th of September. And I'd like to leave about a month beforehand so I can do some sightseeing on the way. So, let's say you want to leave on the 27th of August. I was planning to leave around the 20th. The 20th of August? OK, that's a Sunday. I'd rather leave on the Monday. Right, the 21st then. So, the 21st. And did you want to fly? Um, I don't really want to have to fly uh, straight there. Actually... Yes? I'd like to go by train and ferry to Paris. What about going through the Channel Tunnel? Well, um, I don't like the idea of going through tunnels. It scares me. Oh, it's just like catching the London Underground. I never catch the Underground. The ferry trains are pretty frequent, so you won't have to worry about that part of the journey. And where to after Paris? Vienna. Before you listen to the next part of the dialogue, look at questions 6 to 10. As you listen to the rest of the dialogue, answer questions 6 to 10. From Paris to Vienna, by plane or train? Train. I'd like to travel overnight, so I'd like a sleeper if possible. Right. A sleeper to Vienna from Paris. Right. There's an early morning train to Vienna, the 7.50. But that won't work because you want an overnight train. But then there's one at 17.49. Right. And you're lucky, because they leave from the Gare de l'Est, which is right next to the Gare du Nord station where the ferry train comes in. Brilliant. So that gets into Vienna at 8.35 the next morning. You see, that bit of the journey alone costs, uh, let me see, 
£141.80. Is that with the student discount? Yes. And then? I'd like to spend some time in Vienna, about a week perhaps, before going on to Athens. Train again? Well, no. I was thinking of going by plane via Budapest and stopping off there for a couple of days. You do realise that it's going to cost you a lot more going part of the way by plane and part by train. It would work out a lot cheaper if you did it all by train or flew direct. How much are we talking about? Probably about mm, at least £250 more. As much as that? Well, yes. You'll probably have to get a scheduled flight from Budapest to Athens. And that's going to cost a lot more than by train. Well, let's see when we add it all up at the end. And the last leg of the trip from Athens? I want to go from Piraeus by ferry. I see. OK. Now, I'm almost certain there's a ferry service to Alexandria from Piraeus, but I'll have to check. Hmm... The computer's not giving me anything. Can I think this over? I may be making it more complicated than it really is. Oh, oh, by the way, have you checked the visa requirements for each country? Oh, I hadn't thought of that. Right. Can I take a few personal details? OK. Your name? It's James Weston. That's W-E-S-T-O-N. Right, fine. OK, then. And a daytime telephone number? It's 0181 889 4269. I've logged all these details on the computer. I'll just give you the reference. It's I A M I F U R 2. I A M I F U R 2. You just quote this reference when you come in again or telephone. Then it will speed things up a bit. OK, thanks. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section two. You are going to hear a radio broadcast called Postbag. First, look at questions 11 to 16. For questions 11 to 16, complete the blank spaces in the table as you listen. Welcome, and indeed welcome every Friday afternoon at 2.15 to Postbag. Your chance as listeners to let us know what you think about our programs and current issues. This week, our Postbag has been virtually overflowing. Not that we are complaining, mind you. Many of you, in fact, a staggering 4,373 of you, to be precise, have completed Radio South's listener phone-in survey. Some general points. 83% of you think that the radio station has improved over the past year, and only 7% that it has got worse. Most of you think that the radio station provides an excellent service. That's a big thumbs up for Radio South. Some more statistics. A rather disappointing 64% of you did not like the start of the new international radio soap that began on Wednesday evenings last month. Many of you said that it was too vulgar and puerile, with no plot, no excitement, and only 17% said they liked it. We passed on your messages to the producer, and he said that he had received a number of letters and countless phone calls saying how innovative and modern the plot was. In fact, those figures for those listening had more than doubled for the second program. We'll have to wait and see how this one develops. And for 87% of you, the new starting time of 5am for the wake-up show went down really well. Only a small disapproval rating for this one. 
In fact, only 3%. Many of you said the earlier time is a real hit. Unfortunately, the wine show has not gone down well at all. It had a 15% approval rating and 25% who did not like it and 60% don't knows. Sadly, the main comment was that the program is downright boring. Maybe wine's going out of fashion. The full survey will be published next month and it is free on request. And now to our weekly letters slot. Before the radio broadcast continues, look at questions 17 to 20. For these questions, there are four alternatives, A, B, C, and D. Decide which alternative is the most suitable answer for what you hear, and circle the appropriate letter. Sharon from Tasmania has written in to say that she has tried to get through on the telephone to our new message line to leave a message on the voice box, but she finds it too complicated. She says, and I quote, Every time I press a number after the main menu, the line won't accept my message. It's so frustrating. Maybe your voice box should come with a health warning. Well, I can tell you that you're not the first person to have complained about this. In fact, we had 67 letters this past week alone, and complaints have been going up at the rate of 10% a week recently. And we're now looking into the problem. On a more cheerful note, Mary from Sydney, Australia, wrote in to say how refreshing and cheerful she found our station. She says the music and the morning wake-up show she finds really invigorating. We've had lots of similar letters from all around Southeast Asia saying the same thing. From Terry in Auckland, New Zealand, Yuko in Japan and Ahmed in Indonesia. Robin in Australia says it's really an excellent new contribution to the radio scene in the area and encourages us to keep going. Thank you, Robin, for your support. Pangaporn from Thailand wants to know if there are any plans to repeat the English language program, English Worldwide, on Sunday mornings at 9am, or whether we are going to expand the program. We've had so many letters over the past week about English Worldwide. It appears to be hugely popular. Since it started five weeks ago, the number of people tuning in has grown tenfold. There are no plans at the moment to increase the two-hour slot on Friday morning, but if numbers keep increasing at the rate they are, we may have to. Many of you have asked when we are becoming a 24-hour service. The answer is as soon as we can. We now broadcast 19 hours a day and hope to be on air 24 hours a day within the next six months. And now it's over to Marco, who's going to look at the latest cinema and video releases. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section three. You are going to listen to a tutorial with a university lecturer and three of his students. First, look at questions 21 to 25. For these questions, there are four alternatives, A, B, C, and D. 
Decide which alternative is the most suitable answer and circle the appropriate letter. This is our third and last group tutorial of the term. Have you been finding them of any use? Oh yes, I get a lot out of them. Me too. And what about you, Lorraine? Yes, I think so. Okay, right. Anything for this week, Lorraine? No? Okay, Farilla? Well, you know I have two teenage daughters and I'm a single parent. Yes. Well, um, I'm finding it less and less easy to study as a mature student and have a teenage family. The girls have been playing me up. And what exactly do you mean by that? Kimberly, the eldest, has a boyfriend and she's taken to stay out later and later and she's becoming difficult to control. And the younger one, who's 14, misses Kimberly because they were always together. Um, and? And I feel as if I'm letting them down by doing this course. They don't have a father, and all they've got is me. I just don't know what to do. It is a difficult situation, this one. My mum did the same thing. Went back to studying when I was 16, and I think at the time I got really jealous. Of what? The course. The course? Well, it wasn't just the course. It was the other people, and the fact that my mum's time was taken up by other things and people. At the time, I didn't like it at all. That's the problem here, I think. And what happened, Stevie? Well, I started playing up to attract attention and doing some pretty stupid things, in fact, really stupid things. Like what? Oh, go on, tell us. No. Anyway, my mum sat my brother and me down and told us how important the course was for her and us and why she hadn't been able to do it before. And? Well... She said that, even though it had cost her a lot of money, and she was having to work part-time to keep everything going, she was prepared to give it up. And did she? Of course not, Lorraine. We felt pretty stupid. After that, we helped out more, and both of us got a job, a small job, so that she didn't have to give us any pocket money. Uh, well, Frida, maybe you should try the same approach. I think I might just give it a try. Thanks, Stevie, you're a star. And what about you then, Stevie? Before you listen to the rest of the tutorial, look at questions 26 to 30. As you listen, complete the blank spaces for questions 26 to 30. I've got a rather more mundane problem. Well, maybe not that mundane. Mm-hmm. I had to type a paper for a seminar for this Friday, and I had everything almost ready and... And? My laptop crashed. Haven't you got a copy on this? No, I... You're crazy. This isn't the first time it's happened to you. Haven't you learnt by now? I know, I know. But that doesn't help me at the moment, does it? You just don't listen, do you? Leave him alone, Lorraine. You're not exactly helping, are you? I... I think Farilla is right. There's no point in crying over spilled milk. Have you a rough copy? Yes, but... You can type it in again. I'm very slow, and I'm not going to get it done in time. I also have to get OHPs together as well. They were on the computer, and it was just as I was printing them out that the machine went. I also have to hand a typed-up summary in 2,000 words, bound as well, to Dr. Johnson the day before. And, on top of that, I have to hand in the full paper at the end of the seminar. As it goes towards my final grade, and a credit is taken off for handing papers in late, I have to do it. And it's Tuesday now, so I haven't really got much time. I nearly didn't come today. Don't worry, Stevie. I'll help you do it if you want. We can start straight after the tutorial. Will you, Farilla? Yes. You should let him do it himself. No, Lorraine. He helped me, so I don't see why I shouldn't help him. You could lend a hand too, you know. You don't know when you might need help. I... I... It's okay, Farilla. We can do it together. Well, two people sorted. Now, what about you, Lorraine? That is the end of section three. 
You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 4 You are going to hear two extracts from a lecture by a journalist on becoming a music critic and then what a music critic's job involves. First, look at questions 31 to 37. As you listen, answer questions 31 to 37. And how did it all start? Many times I have been asked how someone becomes a journalist and how I myself became a music critic. There is no set path. After doing an MA in music, I worked in a London bookshop for a couple of months, then as a sub-editor for an educational publication. After I left that, like many of my colleagues, I wrote freelance features for various newspapers and magazines in the music world. My counterparts on other newspapers made their entry to music criticism by totally different routes. Some took courses in journalism, some wrote features which they then sent round newspapers and journals until they were published, while others took some less orthodox steps. After a couple of years freelancing, Rather than moving into the editorial field in journalism, I was given the rare opportunity to become a music critic on a national newspaper, on a retainer. For those of you who don't know what it is, a retainer is a fixed yearly sum paid for a certain number of, in my case, concert reviews. Cheap labour was a prestige thrown in by way of compensation. To many, the work of a music critic is glamorous, and in some respects, I have to admit, it is. I have the rare chance to meet interesting people, but like any other profession, it has its downside. The concert going public do not seem to be able to take on board the fact that when I'm reviewing a concert, I am working. At concerts, people have the habit of descending on me like vultures to talk music. Would they appreciate it if I pounced upon them at work to enthuse about accountancy, obscure legal matters? I think not. And also it can be a very lonely profession, working on your own for days, weeks sometimes, without human contact except by telephone or computer. Another drawback is having to write reviews to deadlines on a daily basis. And despite what many people believe, the salary is not that good unless you occupy one of the prestigious posts on a national paper. Yet it's not all negative. The travel, I must say, I do enjoy tremendously. On the street near my flat, I was once stopped and asked to help complete a survey. Washing machine, madam? No. Microwave? No. Television? Just. And how many times do you go abroad per year, madam? About once every ten days. I never tire of seeing new places, or indeed of revisiting old friends. The States I visit about three times a year on average. Other countries in Europe about ten to twelve times a year. With about six of these being the Scandinavian countries. The rest of the trips tend to be one-off special journeys to exciting places like Greenland, Japan, Nova Scotia, Iceland, the Pacific Islands, etc. Before the speaker delivers the next extract from her talk, look at questions 38 to 40.
As you listen to the next part of the talk, complete the lecture notes in the spaces provided. And what is the role of the music critic today? Listening has always been a talent. Now it is a rare and fragile one. The journalist Michael Ignatieff has recently presented us in the United Kingdom with a provocative television series on the three-minute culture. Three minutes, he says, is just about as long as the average person can concentrate. There is such a wash of music around us which threatens to become a tidal wave. Audiences coming out of London's Festival Hall and setting out for the journey home put on their sonny Walkmans with their overcoats. Avid festival goers, likely to be hearing three or four recitals a day, pack their cassette tapes and CDs in their luggage in order not to have to endure silence in their hotel rooms. The critic's job is to foster the talent of discriminating listening against all odds. People have a real inferiority complex when it comes to trusting their own ears. Friends and acquaintances often expect me to tell them what they should think after a concert. But if I don't, then someone else surely will. A critic's responses or pointers can at least, perhaps, act as disinterested touchstones amongst the babble of hype and market forces. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.